let's get to the second uh, misconception. Right? Um, the second misconception is that you have to really need well. Uh, a lot of videos will tell you that, uh, oh, you have to need your chapati for five minutes and 10 minutes. And some people will need for 15 minutes to get a really soft chapati and so on. Right. Um, that is the way I'd say this. this. So, yes, you will actually get a pretty soft chapati if you need well. So there is uh, there is no question about that. But I think that's missing the point about uh, how gluten formation actually works in the context of chapati dough versus when you're actually making something like a bread, right? Uh, and so on. So when you're using maida versus atta, right? So the first and foremost, a very quick high level introduction to what gluten actually is, right? So regular flour has uh, two kinds of proteins, uh, glutenin and gliadin, right? When you add water, they have the special property of really forming these long chains that are elastic, right? Now, if you remember rice, when you cook rice, uh, the amylose and you know, amylopectin, the amylose actually becomes sort of absorbs water and becomes mushy, a gel like structure, but it's brittle in the sense that if you pull the rice grain apart, it's not going to stretch. It's just going to break up. On the other hand, glutenin and gliadin in, um, in wheat, which incidentally, by the way, also has amylose and amylopectin as starches. In fact, 80 or 90% of your wheat flour is still mostly carbohydrates. The 10 or 15% of the protein that it has is tremendously useful because in the presence of water, it forms this stretchy elastic thing. That is what allows us to make bread or chapati for that matter. Right now, the interesting thing to remember is that this happens the moment you add water, you actually don't need to need it all. So my first tip for you is that as long as you don't add salt, uh, because salt actually makes gluten a little bit tougher. Uh, if you let the unsalted dough, just add water, bring it to a light mix so that all the water is kind of absorbed and let it sit for 30 minutes. Right? After 30 minutes, you will find that even the lightest amount of kneading will yield a perfectly sort of shape, uh, perfectly smooth uh, gluten structure in your chapati dough. Right. So you can save you a lot of the uh, shoulder exercise, you know, others, of course, the shoulder exercise was the point. Uh, then in case, you know, go ahead and do it, uh, but you don't. Right. So this process is called auto leasing. Right. So in fact, it's used in bread baking all the time uh, and it really develops uh, gluten structure uh, much, much better. But, you know, it's important to remember a couple of other things. Right. A uh, couple of other sidebars here. If you've realized why, um, if you ever tried to make chapati using maida, you will find that it is difficult to do so. Why? Because it gets really stretchy uh, and really chewy, right? Because in maida, uh, gluten formation is much better. Uh, so, you know, for those, for the misinformation universe that says that atta, no, atta has uh, more protein, is more nutritious, etc. Yes, it's, it's true in one sense. Uh, but actually, from the point of view of gluten formation, atta is actually terrible. But that's by design. So, you know, ancient, in ancient India, obviously, we figured out uh, that to actually make chapati, we don't want chewy chapati. We actually want a flaky chapati. There should just be enough gluten structure so that uh, it holds my food. But it shouldn't be like, you know, rubbery, chewy, which is what you get if you try to make chapati um, out of maida, right? So what they actually did is they figured out a way, a milling process called the chakki milling process. So that's what your label says, chakki, ground data, and so on. Um, is basically these two heavy granite stones that really damage the grain to the point where they damage a fair amount of the gluten and the starches itself. In fact, the heat is so much that some of the starch gets cooked uh, in atta, right? So this is what yields a flaky, perfect chapati. But if you try to bake bread with it, it will always be a disaster. So for anyone who's tried to bake bread with atta, this is why it's a disaster, right? And yet at the same time, for those of you living in the West, if you've ever tried to make chapati with anything other than atta, you will notice that you will get an extremely chewy and absolutely unpalatable product. So basically that's, that's the whole idea of how a lot of this works. A couple of other general tips. Uh, the more water you use in kneading your chapati, the softer your chapati will be. Okay. Uh, but the more water you add, the more sticky uh, and really hard, uh, to knead and makes a massive mess and uh, and so on. So there's a certain balance. Typically, about 100% by weight is uh, is what uh, uh, we recommend from a chapati standpoint. But you know, again, it depends on the conditions in your home, the humidity, and so on. So more water in general, softer uh, chapati. Also, you can add eggs or milk uh, to make it softer. Uh, these are also ways of enriching uh, not just the nutrition but also the the taste, uh, the softer taste of your chapati. In fact, sometimes naan or kulchas will use eggs and milk. Um, as instead of just plain water and so on, right? But um, if you want a flakier product, right? So especially like lacha parathas or and so on, 
the idea is to add fat right so what happens is fat actually shortens gluten development right which is why uh, in fact in many cases uh, short bread right essentially is is some kind of flour kneaded with a ton of butter or fat so that the gluten strands are so short so that you get a biscuity crumbly feel so that's short bread or biscuits right but in case of paratha you just want enough fat so that the gluten strands are not very long right so that essentially gives you a flakier uh, product uh, as opposed to a chewier product so this is essentially tips for you to you know depending on how you like your chapati or breads right now uh, my third misconception is uh, is that baking soda is is bad for health now again let me some caveat here uh, and the reason i'm saying hmm as opposed to it's just plain wrong is the fact that look you know um, anything in large quantities is pretty much bad for health right so in that sense uh, so i do not want to make nutritional claims this is essentially a session about uh, food science and cooking um, and taste right so the misinformation around why baking soda is bad of course if you eat a ton of baking soda you'll you'll feel uncomfortable right uh, you will you will burp a lot um, and sometimes you get that taste uh, in some cheap restaurant food where they will sometimes use baking soda quite a lot uh, for very valid reasons uh, and we'll kind of explain why why restaurants use baking soda uh, and why if you use it in the right amounts in your home kitchen it will it will change your life for start is actually a, a very magical multi purpose superhero right and i think you should really keep a, a small amount of baking soda right next to the salt and sugar because you need to be using it far more regularly uh, than than you normally do right one it can accelerate the maillard reaction so uh, baking soda is basic as opposed to acidic right so lemon juice is acidic yogurt is acidic tamarind is acidic but uh, baking soda is basic right uh, maillard reaction is what makes your food deliciously brown especially when you fry it in oil or saute anything uh, at temperatures above 110 celsius food becomes brown and it's absolutely delicious right uh, especially if you are sauteing onions till they go brown in color you may want to use uh a little bit of baking soda because it acts absolutely creates a fantastic uh uh browning uh, of your onions you use too much the whole thing turns into mush so use very tiny pinch goes a long way right second thing obviously it can it can be used to salvage uh, any you know uh, poorly fermented idli or any kind of uh, a product where you think the fermentation is not good enough biological fermentation is not good enough you can always help yourself with a little bit of baking soda but you have to add some acid along with it as well but the third and often less uh, appreciated one and this is in fact why restaurants use it regularly is the fact that baking soda can break down pectin all plant cell walls have pectin right so in fact the reason why a chana or a chana dal or you know kabuli chana or rajma take such a long time to cook is because there's a ton of pectin um and this baking soda actually accelerates the breakdown of pectin so a pinch of baking soda when you you know pressure cook chana or rajma will will literally uh halve your cooking time and restaurants use it because it saves cooking fuel uh, and for them margins are really important right now obviously the reason if you use too much of it and you literally taste unused baking soda that's nasty right so you obviously you have to use some kind of acid to compensate for that so every time you are using baking soda at some point of time towards the end maybe squeeze some lime or something that neutralizes any unutilized uh, baking soda so in fact when you pressure cook uh, chole uh, you add a little bit of baking soda and you add tea bags um, a tea is acid and it will neutralize any unutilized baking soda uh, and also give it a beautiful brown color so that's the added so the tea is not added for the brown color it's actually added to neutralize the baking soda so we've got forgotten the reason right now and last but not the least it can also clean your kitchen it's a fantastic abrasive uh, along with vinegar uh, it's a fantastic cleaning agent uh, so if you, if you don't like chemicals uh, you might want to use uh, this to clean your kitchen these are chemicals too but at the end of the day you know, so you might consider those other chemicals more harmful than so on okay now my fourth misconception is uh, is the fact that uh, microwaves are underutilized and again the cause of misconception comes from a nutritional claim which i am not going to address barring the fact that look uh to new uh like uh just don't go with any waves are bad or, or cooking is bad or boiling is bad or steaming is better and so on it's complicated depending on the ingredient and depending on your metabolism and your genetics you know everybody is unique uh and in the sense that some foods you have to cook in order for you to get some of those nutrients for example carrots uh 
uh, and uh, tomatoes, for instance, you get more nutrition when you eat them cooked as opposed to when you eat them raw. But we regularly eat them raw too. So it's not just often a, a, a blind decision that this is the right way to do it. Uh, we often don't only make nutritional decisions when we eat. We also make taste and texture and, and enjoyment decisions that don't always necessarily are always sort of in the direction of great nutrition and so on. So it's nutrition isn't the only thing. Yes, it's, it's important. But beyond that, we also enjoy food, right? So for starters, microwaves, no, they don't. Okay. Uh, for starters, I think uh, microwave suffers from this problem that it is considered radiation. And, you know, the moment people think radiation, they think Chernobyl, they think gamma rays, x-rays, and so on. If you did already know, microwaves have less energy than visible light and infrared light, which is which is what heats up your food uh, in, say, an oven and so on, right? Literally, putting your food outside under the sun can also cook it over a uh, given enough time. At least in Chennai, it can cook it over a couple of hours and so on. But the interesting thing is that you're actually taking microwaves of a very specific frequency and you're, you're concentrating it in a small box, right? If you actually take a stadium floodlight type thing, put it in a box and put food in it, it will cook faster than a microwave. Now, therefore, for starters, microwave as dangerous radiation, no, microwaves are exceedingly low energy compared to any of what you otherwise consider dangerous radiation. Okay? Uh, the reason microwaves work, whereas other forms of uh, uh, radiation don't necessarily are practical in the kitchen is because of uh, uh, some really, really cool quantum mechanics that I will not go into here. It's there in the book. You can read it. It's a fantastic story, right? Microwaves apparently of a specific frequency have the ability to flip water molecules, which we said were polarized as you know, positive and negative. In the electromagnetic field of the microwaves, it keeps flipping the magnetic fields if you keep changing the direction of the microwaves, right? Because it's a closed surface. And that's what your microwave device does. It keeps flipping the direction of the microwaves so that the water molecules keep uh, keep flipping. And once water molecules flip, they heat up, right? So microwaves literally cooks food by heating up the water inside the food. And that's all that's happening. There is no other dangerous radiation, ionizing radiation, all that kind of stuff, right? So it is in fact a wonderfully, you know, safe and nutritious way to you know, cook food, if you will, right? Now, some cool things that you didn't know, um, because it only heats up water, you can't cook uh, anything that does not have too much water. Uh, yes, you can heat some things up, uh, but for most part, uh, it has unless it has enough water, uh, a microwave is largely useless. Which we can put to great use uh, by actually, if you if you're short on time, you can make a fantastic instant microwave sabji by taking either coconut milk or a yogurt uh, kind of base. Remember that both coconut, uh, sorry, coconut milk and yogurt are actually fat water emulsions in that they have both fat as well as water. Uh, they've been mechanically agitated in a way that they form an, uh, they form an emulsion, right? Uh, so they, they're not dissolved to each other. So we know fats and water don't mix, but they can be, uh, they can form an emulsion, right? So because now uh, the fat itself does not get heated up by the microwave, the water does, you can now use this kind of base to actually make one shot sabjis. You can literally take coconut milk, add some canned chickpeas, uh, some powdered onion. Um, so onion powder, garlic powder, dhania powder, salt, uh, and so on. Um, and you can literally make something that's a very, very decent, uh, you know, chana style sabji because of the coconut, maybe a Malabar style chana sabji, if you will. Um, it's quite delicious, right? And in literally three minutes of time, right? So you, you may want to experiment with that, right? So same thing with the yogurt as well. Likewise, uh, another thing that I often find people not using is the low power setting, right? Um, so let's say you want to melt butter. Right? So it's quite common for people to take the butter out and say 15 seconds. Uh, and by the way, 15 seconds at high power will literally boil all the water in your butter and it'll practically turn into ghee. Okay? That's not what you want, right? Um, so what we want is to use the low power setting. So which means that if a microwave has 2000 watts of power, you can also cook um, uh, with uh, you know 800 watts of power or 500 watts of power, right? So check your settings and use the lowest heat setting so that it just melts the butter without evaporating the water, right? So these are just some tips uh, that I give on microwaves, right? Uh, and my last couple of ones, as we get to the more interesting ones, MSG. Uh, again, uh, a misconception based on uh, bad signs uh, from the point of view of nutrition. Uh, the, the whole idea that MSG is bad for health came from a racist article in the 70s uh, that was not founded on science at all. Uh, it was just some random guy who, uh, who basically connected the fact that he felt uneasy uh, to the Chinese food that he was eating uh, with absolutely no uh, connection. That said, yes, 
it's possible that there are people like gluten allergies there are people who might be allergic uh, in but then again small quantities uh, for most part right be aware whether you have allergies or not that's a very tiny percentage of the population way more people are actually allergic to peanuts or gluten than they are actually to msg um, and so therefore it's largely not a concern in tiny amounts it actually makes no difference right so this is a this is a this is just just yeah, it started out as racism um, in um, in the United States, and we've just continued to believe that it somehow yeah, it causes brain damage and so on. Right? So very simple. Monosodium glutamate is a sodium salt of an amino acid. Okay? And amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. We are literally made of amino acids. And by the way, just if you just take glutamic acid, which is the which is the acid from which the salt is made, there's literally two kgs of that in your body. If you are about 70, 75 kgs, there's two kgs of just glutamic acid based, you know, in your protein. Uh, and so on. So if you have two kgs of it in your body already, a pinch of it in your Chinese food is not going to hurt you, right? And sodium is essential for body and glutamic acid is, is an amino acid, right? So that's one. Why it's useful is that it's actually concentrated umami. So let me kind of explain what umami is, right? So there are, you know, we used to think there are four tastes. There is uh, sweet, salt, uh, bitter, and sour. And then the Japanese discovered that there's also this uh, taste called umami, which is which amplifies other tastes and it gives it, it lengthens the sensation of the other tastes, right? So it's not a sensation by itself. So if it is salt and umami, you will feel the, the taste linger longer in your mouth, right? So it amplifies other tastes and while also making it linger for longer periods of time. And what's the amazing is that more recent research actually, and this research is still ongoing is that People can detect umami. In other words, people can detect glutamates on their tongue at one fifth the concentration of salt, right? And salt is something that our tongues are phenomenally good at detecting. And we detect this. We still don't quite know why we have a taste. Uh, once one, one unexplained theory is, is the fact that ultimately this is a way of detecting proteins because amino acid, you know, glutamic acid is a protein. So because you know, proteins are important for us, uh, it's just evolved as a way for us to be able to make sure that we eat enough uh, proteins uh, and so on. So that's basically is one theory, but it's, it's not verified yet, right? So what umami really does is that it amplifies and lengthens other tastes. Um, and it, it also... Uh, more importantly, is present in a ton of things that you're already eating. Right? If you're eating Parmesan cheese, if you're eating mushrooms, if you're eating uh, uh, fish, if you're eating shrimps, if you're eating uh, tomatoes, all of these are exceedingly rich in glutamates. Right? So if you have a problem with MSG, you might want to stop eating every one of those other things as well. Right? So as I said, it's, it's safe in small quantities and it's, it's a fantastic addition to anything you make, especially dry dishes works very well. Uh, sprinkling a tiny bit of, uh, here's another interesting thing, right? So if you're someone, um, uh, so saltiness, for example, is our tongue's ability to detect sodium. Typically it's our tongue detecting sodium is what we feel salt. So literally all sodium salts will taste salty, uh, not just sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is the saltiest of the lot, but uh, to varying degrees, sodium bicarbonate, monosodium glutamate, every sodium salt will taste salty. Uh, to your tongue, right? In fact, MSG is about one third as salty because of the sodium as sodium chloride. So if you're using one teaspoon of salt and instead you use three fourths of a teaspoon and add uh, one quarter of a teaspoon of MSG, you will get the umami effect and the salty effect as well while consuming less sodium overall. Okay? So that's something for you to think about. Okay? Now, last couple of things before we get into Q&A is uh, obviously one of my uh, favorite topics. You know, if you've uh, if you followed me on Twitter, you would have heard uh, me you know, sort of mention this like a million times. Uh, most people think pressure cooking is measured in number of whistles. Uh, and that is, let's just say this. Um, you achieve the right outcomes by measuring whistles. And in fact, counting in whistles in your home environment for your stuff, for the same amount of heat and for the same pressure cooker will work perfectly fine. The where it breaks down is that if you suddenly have to use an induction stuff or a new cooker or a new, uh, or a new, you know, uh, stuff, which has a different heat output and so on, the whole thing will break down. Right now, uh, for that, you kind of have to understand how a pressure cooker works, which is that you put water, you put your food, uh, and then you heat it. Right. So once the pressure inside reaches to at least one bar above what is normal atmospheric pressure, the safety valve will just rise the, the weight and the excess pressure will be let out. Right. And so it, goes back down below that one bar of uh, pressure again, and then it will build up pressure again, and then it will do that. Now, 
if you if your heat source is higher if you're using an induction stove where the heating is very very fast the frequency with which it will build back pressure again is very small so in fact if you use your induction stove and try to cook rice at a 2000 watt setting and say three whistles for rice you will end up with uncooked rice undercooked rice right this is because the whistle by itself is nothing more than an indication that it has reached peak pressure and it has just fallen back just a little bit right the value you need to keep in mind is how much time are you spending once the first whistle has reached which is the peak pressure which is one bar above atmospheric pressure right why do we do this because at one bar above atmospheric pressure water boils not at 100 celsius but at 121 celsius so because you're able to cook at a higher temperature while water is still liquid uh, you can cook faster uh, and uh, uh, you can do several other interesting things as well in fact uh, if you pressure cook without water and with especially things that already contain water like say carrots you can add carrots and butter uh, and then literally pressure cook with no water for about uh, six or seven minutes and it'll what you'll get caramelized carrot which is actually Maillard reaction it's a misnomer uh, what you get is a fantastic uh, uh, brown version of your carrot which you can then turn into soup has so many flavors that you didn't know carrot actually had, right? So, and last but not the least, uh, as much as possible, especially if you are, other than dealing with tough cuts of red meat, avoid cooking meat in pressure cookers. Okay. So, two things. Meat always gets harder when you cook and uh, vegetables get softer when you cook. This is a very important distinction. So, plant material becomes softer with the heat and muscle tissue and meat in general gets harder right so the uh, in fact uh, chicken breast is notorious that the lightest amount of uh, overcooking and it you just end up with dry uh, chicken anytime right so a couple of things to remember unless you're using uh, cuts that have bones in them in which case pressure cooking uh, will end up uh, sort of uh, causing a lot of the connective tissue to turn into gelatin which again makes the the meat softer and so on but the muscle tissue will still be dry right so unless you're dealing with very, very tough cuts of meat, avoid pressure cooking meat in general. The ideal way to cook meat is slow and low. We may not have the time. If you do not have the time, by all means, pressure cook. And in any case, I think, you know, uh, Indian cooking does not rely on the intrinsic flavor uh, or texture of the meat itself. We add a ton of other flavor outside of it. So it doesn't really matter if the, uh, if the mutton or, or beef or pork is overcooked uh, because you can always add a ton of other flavors uh, to make it tasty. Uh, but... If you have the time for it, slow cook it is you'll always get uh, way, way better uh, outcomes, right? My last one, which is probably the most controversial one, um, which is that uh, uh, marination adds flavor to meat. Now, the answer to this is yes, but there are strong caveats, right? Marination adds flavor only to the surface of the meat. Marination does not penetrate inside the surface, right? There's enough science about it. You can, you know, I talk about it in the book as well. I link to a lot of science as well. But, um, and there are some fantastic videos uh, by Adam Ragusea on YouTube where you can see where he actually uses a dye and marinates, you know, uh, meat for a ton of time, like, you know, sometimes six or seven days. And you actually see that the, the dye does not penetrate barely under the skin. Okay? So let's remember that marination adds flavor only to the surface of the meat, right? So here is my, you know, contra, you know, here is my thing that you perhaps uh, may have found surprising. Marinating for 24 hours is a waste of time. Marinating for half an hour is no different from marinating for 24 hours. That said, uh, if you kind of know that someone is marinating for 24 hours and they're using a traditional recipe and it's your grandmother's recipe and you know it's being cooked in some special copper vessel and all that, you will naturally find it tasty because a lot of taste perception is actually psychological. Uh, just knowing, for example, knowing that something that what you're drinking is expensive wine has been shown to uh, you know, improve the taste of the wine. The same thing applies to food as well. But in a blind taste test, most people cannot distinguish between a half an hour marinated chicken and a 24 hour marinated chicken. Right, But what does add flavor inside is brining. Brining is essentially putting meat inside a salt solution. Uh, it varies, you know, anywhere between 8 to 10% salt uh, solution. Uh, you can add other flavoring as well. By osmosis, the salt actually gets directly inside. And by the way, once salt gets inside meat, it actually makes the meat retain water. Now, again, this, is, uh, this might seem non-intuitive because when you add salt to vegetables, the water comes out. When you add salt to meat, when you brine meat and what salt goes in, then it retains water. Now, it's not, it's not, it's quite obvious when you think about what happens when we all exercise and we get dehydrated, 
right? So when we get dehydrated in the sun, we actually drink not just water and sugar and other electrolytes, but we drink along with salt. Salt is important because if you don't drink that salt, all that water will, you'll be lost again, right? So salt actually helps muscle tissue retain water, right? So that's why we drink salt along with uh, electrol or whatever it is when we get dehydrated. It's the same principle here. So you want to get the salt into the meat and that will help the muscle tissue not dehydrate too much during the cooking process. So it will remain juicy. And it is literally the only way to make chicken breast not taste terrible, right? So it, it's game changing. If you're making biryani, try brining for about uh, an hour and then marination for half an hour. That's all you need, right? So uh, anyway, more in my book and so on, right? Don't over marinate, okay? So it's actually quite common. Um, it's fine if you're actually not using too much lime juice or strongly sour yogurt, uh, you're, you, can, you, can, you can still go ahead and do a 24 hour marination, no harm. But if you're using a very, very acidic marinade, acids will actually denature and cook proteins. Okay? Um, and you'll actually get a far worse product at the end, right? And again, sometimes uh, you have to remember Sometimes cooking the meat in tandoor. A tandoor is almost close to 500 to 600 Celsius. Okay? The cooking in your home happens in the 100 to 150 Celsius range on a pan. Maybe in your oven, maximum 200 Celsius. At 500 Celsius, a lot of things are different. Right? You can cook very rapidly uh, without overcooking or moisture loss. Right? So if you are cooking at home and you don't have a tandoor, don't over okay? Right. So my last uh, thing before we get to Q&A, is uh, sort of some general uh, cheat sheet on how to think about spices, right? So India without just do okay complementary spice. Here I want to long and powdered spices. Okay. This is. Uh, um, for those buying spice powders, uh, and I know a ton of these companies are now cursing me, which is that if you're buying spice powders, store them in the freezer, not even in the fridge. They don't last very long. So the moment you mechanically damage spices, the whole idea of spice flavors is volatile aroma. The meaning of word volatile is that all of those flavors, every time you smell it, you're literally losing flavor. Okay. So now, therefore, if you're buying powdered spices, store them in the freezer and keep whole spices. And then as much as possible, grind them just before you need it, right? So that's one, right? Um, when it comes to fresh spices like ginger, garlic, and you know, wet spices and so on, the amount of strength of flavor you get is dependent on how you actually choose to cut it. So the way you do mechanical damage to it makes a difference, right? So pasting garlic will give you the strongest garlic flavor versus mincing garlic versus chopping garlic versus just using the whole clove itself, right? You may, you may actually then use it appropriately. You don't always want the strongest flavor. So if you don't want the strongest flavor, then don't, you know, don't fine mince it or fine paste it, right? Similarly, for dry spices, a mortar and pestle will extract more flavor uh, than a blender or mixy because a mortar and pestle literally crush the cells and extract those uh, aromas, whereas a blender or mixy is moving too fast. And it's only literally just cutting some parts of it uh, and you lose a ton of the aroma in the heat itself, right? So mortar and pestle especially is, is a good way to make sure that you maximize. Then again, convenience always trumps everything. And it's a stylistic choice. If you actually want a stronger or a weaker flavor, go ahead, you know, use a blender mixy or use a whole garlic uh, and so on. Last but not the least, um, see spice flavor molecules tend to dissolve in oil and alcohol, not water. Okay. So if you're adding spices to a gravy, Remember that it's mostly getting lost. Okay. You may still want you may still want it because you can add extra spice powder. You lose some of it, and then you you're you're sort of you keep tasting it, and you get the right mix and so on. But remember this: that uh, the reason Indian cooking starts with oil and whole spices is that that's when you want to extract a lot of the spices uh, into the oil before they escape off. Right? So that's the primary goal of that, right? Uh, and likewise, alcohol, right? So if you're cooking with oil. Once you add a ton of this ginger, garlic, etc., try adding a splash of hard alcohol like vodka or rum, and you'll find that it improves the taste of dish because it'll extract more spice flavors uh, from all the other ingredients as well, right? Uh, which is why we use whole spices at the start of a dish, powdered spices towards the end, because powdered spices lose aroma really quickly. You don't need to cook powdered spices to death. So adding powdered spices at the start of a cooking process is actually largely meaningless, unless you add a ton of it and you want to reduce the flavor. 
So cooked powdered spices like garam masala are added literally right at the end, right? And by the way, you can actually apply this to most things. If you're making, say, roasted jeera powder, try adding a little bit of it right at the end as opposed to a ton of it at the start. And you'll find that uh, the effect is largely the same. So with that, just go make some delicious food and uh, you can connect with me on Twitter at, uh, at Krishashow. Thank you.